Welcome along, guys, to the first episode of the Notcast, which is a show that I've had in the making for probably about six years. Never really got around to it. Had ideas in my head for a very long time. Never got around to it, like I say. But um, we're going to make a go of it, see what we can do. And um, of course, a show like this would be pretty boring if you was just listening to me on my own. So I have roped in the help of a um, rather famous American dude who um, you all know, you all love. And um, he loves to take the piss out of me from time to time and uh, generally make my life a living hell. But uh, welcome along to Death Wish. How you doing, buddy? Oh, Talking to me? Uh, okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have my rockets ready. Uh, ah, excellent. Uh, excellent. Yeah, so uh, if we get into a game somehow on, on voice, then, hey, I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> well, uh, I'm not sure that a, uh, a, a voice-only podcast would benefit from uh, a game of Worms, but, you know, if you do want a game of Worms where i always am for that so the general idea behind the show guys is we are going to sit here and chat for an hour or two depending on how much death wish wants to be the rambling man of course we'll try and stop him and make him i never do that well what are you just what are you talking about oh, uh, we'll I'm put sorry. the time on him uh, don't worry I'll, I'll keep the reins in on him just to make sure he's not uh, going off too much into the distance. We're hopefully going to bring you some content of various topics and just go off on tangents among ourselves and just bring in some random content, do a bit of spontaneity and see where it goes. Of course, if you guys would like us to cover anything in particular in the future, be sure to let us know down in the comments below. Also, we're going to try and involve some special guests down the line. So if you've got any... Oh, hey. Yeah, special guests. So Like, if, like who? Oh, well... I'd be telling. Oh, you know, uh, top, top, top secret. Yeah. Top secret. Top secret. So if you guys want to see anybody on the show in particular, please do let us know and uh, we'll see what we can arrange. But uh, I don't know, maybe we should just jump into it, Deathwish. So uh, how you been, buddy? Anyway, how is um, everything over in DW land right now? Uh, you're talking to me. Well, I think your name is DW, isn't it? So no, it's Deathwish 808. Oh. Or, oh, sorry, it's it's the weekend. Do you, do you go by Mandy now? Is that right? Yeah. Uh, uh, DW808 is fine. <laughs> yeah, what's what, what's happening, buddy? What have you been up to? Uh, uh, a lot of sleeping. A lot of not sleeping. You know me. Been playing a game, actually. That, oh, really? Have you? Uh, what, what game might that be? Uh, it's called Viewfinder. And somehow... You've gotten access to my library on Steam and was playing it, and then I decided to play it. So, I don't know. Maybe do you want to talk about this game then? Should we have a conversation about this game? You know, because like clearly this isn't a uh, scripted segment of the show where we're going to get together and talk about something that we've both done and then comment on our thoughts and feedback about it. Totally not scripted. So, um, yeah, Viewfinder. No, um so I've noticed that quite a few people in the community have got it on their wish lists, and it seems to be a game that is quite popular among the, the, the Portal 2 guys. So do you want to kind of give a brief overview, Deathwish, of what the game is about? Uh, uh, from my point of view, it's kind of trippy. I think the concept of, of the game, just from what they have on the, the, the their store page, uh, is about just what it says, Viewfinder. It's cameras, and it's kind of perspective based and they start you out very simple and it graduates more and more where you're using pictures that you take or that you're given off of like cork boards and you can rotate them and then paste them literally in 3d space and then walk on them and kind of get to places that you couldn't get to without doing that i don't know i'm not very good at describing that but as the game moves on it gives you more and more like ways to do things and before it finally gives you a camera that you can freely take pictures of we probably should have mentioned at the top of this um spoiler alert so um if, if anybody out there who um 
wants to uh, play this, um, yeah, caution spoilers. Yeah, definitely a lot of spoilers. <laughs> um, so, yeah, looking at the Steam page, it says, uh, the, like, the, the top-level description of this is challenge perception, redefine reality, and reshape the world around you with an instant camera. Viewfinder is a new single-player game offering gamers hours of interesting and fun experiences while uncovering the mysteries left behind. Now, this is a game that I hadn't really um, heard of and, and seen, and it was actually you, Deathwish, who brought it to my attention. So, I mean, I hadn't gone in and seen any trailers or any information about the game before playing it. You watched me play the first couple of hours of the game, and you'd obviously played yourself. But I have to say... Like, from the outset of the game, I was really impressed. There is so much to this game and so much... For, for something that's so simple in the game, I found that the way the pictures work is very interesting. And it was quite unbelievable, shall I say. And, like, when you place the pictures down, like, it just... If you, if you place it down in the world, it, like, cuts out the geometry that's already there. And it's... I don't know how they do it. But no matter where you put that picture, it cuts it out. And I find that quite um, amazing, yeah. really. Um, going a bit further into the game, as you go and sort of like explore around, the next thing that kind of amazed me was like all of the different art styles. So as you travel around the, the environment, you'll find different pictures and drawings and you could just like plot them around. So you can go from like this, this nice 3D world and then you plop down a picture and like all of a sudden you're in a cartoony world. And it's just that seamless integration of all these different art styles was definitely something that um, I was um, really impressed with in this game. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. And what I also liked about that is depending, uh, depending on what art style the picture that you placed is, it had its own, what, depending on the, where you are in the game, it had its own sounds, like the cartoony stuff would, if you jumped, well, there's a lot of things you miss because you kind of, uh, I feel like you kind of rushed through it, which was the opposite of what we normally do. Normally you go for achievements and I rushed through things and that sort of stuff, but uh, I left it running. So I do have a lot more hours, but I think guesstimating i think that i probably played it about a, an hour and a half to two hours longer than you and we are at the same spot yep as far as we're both on chapter four yeah we finished the first three chapters yeah but i have five more achievements and i'm closing in on others that i don't know anything about really i'm just i've just spent a lot of time checking everything out and that sort of thing, which is kind of unlike me, but I really enjoy the atmosphere. Yeah, it it, it kind of it kind of reminds me a little bit of of the witness, not not puzzle wise, but the simplicity of it. Yeah, yeah, just the the overall like feeling of the look of it. Sort of, I mean, it's not as nice, but uh, yeah, it really uh, it's like okay, the simple. Okay, yeah, this is too easy, and then. You move along, and it's like, this is easy. And then it gets to points where uh, one of the points you made was like, when, once you get the camera, it feels easier. Yeah, and I think that is that is like a valid point that I, I I honestly do think once... there's All right, so again, spoiler alert for anybody else that's like listening to this part and does want to does want to play the game. But each level has basically a teleporter and your goal is to get to the teleporter. Some levels you have to activate the teleporter via some means. Now, in the early levels, you have cameras that are set up on tripods and you can't move the camera. So they are in a fixed location. So what I found there was you're quite obviously quite restricted as to what you can do. You can literally only take a picture of what's in front of you. So you then have to think, okay, this is what I can do. How can I manipulate this picture or, or you know, angle this picture around to do what I need to do? Yeah, once you once you take the picture, you can you can go out and put it anywhere you want. You can rotate the picture. Yep. That 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 sort of thing. Which, yeah, spoiler, uh, obviously by now. But anyway, you can rotate it. 
and you can do all kinds of things. And I've gone to myself, I've gone to places and maps that I don't think were meant to be got. Yeah. To. And, and <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to the camera point in a minute, but that's another thing that I kind of feel it's the sort of game where, although you made the point where I, I've kind of gone pretty fast through it, it does make me want there's, there's something about the game that makes me want to see how i can use the pictures and manipulate the scenery in a way to get to areas i'm not potentially supposed to so you know oh there's a roof there how can i get to that roof can i get to that roof and it does kind of give you that sense of exploration but i think for me personally it, it is something i will go back to and, and spend more time on i think it was more a case that i kind of wanted to get a substantial way through the game just so we could obviously talk about it on the show but it's kind of like a play style of mine now is to kind of go through the story of a game potentially like go through it as fast as i can but then in a post game come back to it and then spend a bit more time and explore but i would say that there's although i haven't like explored too much it, it's that sort of game where after a few levels you kind of know what you can and can't do outside of a puzzle so you are also left with that feeling of well there's not really a lot i can interact with so i think i'm just gonna buckle down and, and get on with the puzzle kind of thing which is probably this like where you where i've been up to this point like going through quite a bit faster than you did rather than exploring bits and pieces but there are definitely a set of um more or multiple sets of collectible items within the game because uh i have found some of them so yeah there is that element of go back and explore but to go back to what we were talking about before, so like the fixed camera thing is great up until I think it's the end of chapter two. And then in chapter three, you're actually introduced to a camera that you can carry, which then allows you to take photos of whatever you want. And then you're able to solve puzzles using pictures that you take yourself. And I, I, I do think like at this point in the game, I, I, I don't know, I was kind of hoping that because they're introducing a new mechanic into the game, it was going to start to challenge me and there was going to be some more intricate puzzles. And don't get me wrong, there's some there, there are some really nice puzzles that they've done in Chapter 3, but there was one in particular. Uh, I think it was the one... Do you remember the ones where you've got, like, the timing? They're introduced, like, the timers? Yeah, that that uh, was extremely easy. Yeah, there's like there's just like a whole room of there must have been like a chain of probably about five puzzles in that that whole section, but it was to me it was the same puzzle just over and over again, yeah. and yeah. it was just kind of a bit mundane and a bit simple to, to to kind of get through. There wasn't really much of a challenge there. Yeah, it it basically took previous things and then added in a like you have a switch that powers up the teleporter. And then there's also like a circular timer attached. So yeah, think, think like a, a, like a portal to timer kind of thing is, is just, just for context. And, and basically it, you, you can't go through a teleport, uh, teleporter, uh, unless it's upright, like, you have to be able to walk onto it so yeah you have to be able to put your feet on a teleporter to to get through it and go to either to the if it's sideways or upside down even though it, even if you can stare at it you can't do anything with it unless it's right side up essentially yep. so but uh yeah the without going into too much detail that timer part if you if you cut ties when you take a photo like once you turn it on, it's like this traffic conduit kind of thing that powers it up. If as soon as you take a picture and you place it, it breaks the. It's kind of like a filament and and a light bulb. It breaks it and it springs back, and you have no connection. And like the third round uh, or third chapter, it really goes from using the camera, and you can do things in multiple ways, which is cool. And, and and they're not you're not breaking it but you, know, you can tell but I, I feel like there's one particular map that i broke because if you recall knock the one where you had a picture 
and then he kind of kept moving on and like you got to where you had right in front of you you had the left side was a table and chairs with a photo on the table right side up and you could just walk on over and grab the photo and and place that and on the right side you had it was upside down and you had a photo on the table but it was upside down and that's where i feel like i kind of broke it because i i went left and then i came back around and was able to grab the other one from underneath through the table but it's kind of as as uh freeing as it seems you still have to be very careful about where you place your photos because it takes over anything that's behind it yeah i mean i think if i'm honest there was and if i if my memory serves me right there's 21 puzzles in chapter three yes 21 i don't really feel like i was challenged until puzzle 21 um and even that only only took me like a couple of minutes I feel like that was more of a challenge because the element of taking away your handheld camera was gone and you was back to that original concept of camera on a tripod so i do feel for me for this game Although being able to take a picture of anything you want within your environment is a really cool thing because you can literally take a picture of what you want, put it whatever, and manipulate everything in the map. I do feel like the better puzzles so far for me have come from the static cameras. But that's just, that's just my point. That's just my opinion on that anyway. Yeah, I, I 100% agree in certain ways and some ways i disagree I, well yeah like you're saying with the end of chapter three it took away the camera and it got more to do with kind of illusions yeah so if any, if anybody's just to give a bit of context of like chapter three towards the end anyway it if anybody's played uh super liminal it's very similar to kind of like that it, they change it looks like you're looking at one thing and then you walk up to it it is what it is but then you walk away and come back, and now it's like Wally Coyote and Roadrunner. It's just a 2D image. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, what? Yeah, it was pretty trippy, and uh, which was cool. I really liked that part, even though it wasn't challenging. But I, I liked it just because of what they did with it yeah what i will say is though and you know touched on that like i say it's very that part is very similar to some of the mechanics that are used in super super liminal but i feel like one thing i will say is a positive is they don't constantly reuse the same thing so you'll have a section where let's say they've got like like the one we were talking about with the the timer on the teleporter there's like a section there of about five puzzles which feel I've, feel yeah. feel about the same but then you go to the next area and it's moved on to a completely different mechanic or using something in a different way so they're not just constantly rehashing the same puzzles over and over again they are genuinely coming up with new ideas yeah when you go to a new teleporter once you finish when once you finish a level the goal is to get to the teleporter yeah and once you go through it, then, you know, you end up at some point back at like the hub. I'll just say like base. The hub station. Yeah, hub. Yeah, hub, you know, that kind of thing. But but once you go through another one, yeah, things change. And it's kind of like what to expect. And yeah, the, if if you recall, which I'm sure you do, the... The one where you had a very short distance where you could walk and then you had the, a, a switch and the teleporter that they it was upside down above you yep. and you couldn't touch anything and it's like okay well yep and it's like okay all you gotta do is just take a picture of this and spin it around and nope but nope nope <laughs> you you can't it the viewfinder on the camera is way smaller than your actual view of the game so you have to figure out how to how to get everything in, in one shot and one thing that's interesting that happens earlier on is if you take a picture of one side of something it captures both sides like three-dimensionally yeah. so you can play you can play something and you can like walk around the back side of it to um yeah uh which which is 
made it quite interesting as well. So I think from what I see, getting to four, there's a whole lot more puzzles on chapter four. And then, of course, you have to finish it to unlock what appears to me the last one. It looks like there's five chapters to me. I don't know. Yeah, I, I got that impression that there was five chapters to the game looking at the at the hub and like the way you go between areas i i got that same impression death wish so yeah given that you're kind of like 60 percent through the game based on um five chapters you would expect like chapter four to really start to ramp up the difficulty so i'm i am hopeful that we're gonna see some more puzzles i don't know how many more mechanics they can introduce into it so whether or not we're going to just see the same mechanics reused or if we are going to see something different that'll be interesting personally i think there will be similar mechanics but used in completely different ways yeah otherwise because there, there's when when i got to when i finished chapter three i kind of just walked around just to look at how many teleporters there were and it's like a tower and there's a whole lot of course you can you can go into the train which is like a a monorail that's suspended by who knows what it's on a track uh, uh, yeah the, the track is suspended by what <laughs> don't, don't worry don't worry about that you know you, you, anti you think, anti-gravity you're thinking yeah, about you it too, too, too much the, man <laughs> you walk you walk into the train and you and you it, it has like on the screen it has like a screen it's effectively like a, a chapter select screen basically so you can select your different chapters yeah and it tells you how many puzzles you have left where you are yeah and you go okay i'm not done so you know you so you go i'm going back or i can continue but you can't continue unless you solve enough of them yeah which I, I i'd never really paid much attention to as far as solving and then not being done and being able to move forward because I wanted to finish all of them before I went to the next area. Yeah. And I was also completely trying to find things. My only gripe really is that there's not more things like I found and got to that are like on top, like of roofs and things like that. And there's nothing there and I, I was able to get there which took some manipulation and then there was nothing to actually find there was no achievements which i thought there would be since like you get to some points and it's like okay i can see up there there's like a chair and it looks like i kind of see parts of stuff there's stuff up there so it's like ah i need to go up there there must be something sometimes there is and sometimes it's part of the game sometimes there isn't but yeah yeah i think i think for a game which almost offers the player so much freedom of movement around the environment being more hidden things would be i, I think would would give the player a lot i mean granted i need to go back and, and do more investigation anyway but yeah no I, I totally agree that um it would have been nice to see a lot more as you're in uh, roaming around and in investigating different bits and pieces uh, I mean, I don't want to go on too much longer with the game because obviously we've um, we've been talking about it quite a lot. One other point that I just wanted to make, though, was um, around the story. So the game does feature a story, which I, I won't really go into what the story is about, but it's one of those games where I feel the story isn't directly tied to the game. So you're a guy who likes to play the game rather than take too much notice of the story and you know you, you don't really care what goes on. It is one of those games where you can just pick it up and play it. And the story is not kind of like thrown in your face. The story is more about if you want to know what's going on, the story is revealed via exploration. Yeah, but you don't, you don't, right? I'm like, you could literally just go through and go through the teleporters, do the puzzles and not pay and not run around, do anything. Just do that. And it, and it's fun. Yeah. But, but yeah, because the story has no, it doesn't tell you things that you need to know to solve the puzzle. To, yeah. Solve the puzzles and stuff like that. You could just go through it and whatever. But if you do that, you will miss out on 
Like if you're, an, you know, an achievement hunter. Sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. Depends on the game. So this one, I kind of been taking my time and just kind of checking things out and really messing with how far I can go with what I can do with the photos and that sort of thing. And yeah, anything behind the photos, when you place them, it deletes everything behind it. So anyway, anyway I say uh, we can move on. Yeah, so again, um, just to kind of bring it all to a close, I mean, I if, if you like puzzle games, it's, it is one that I would recommend. Obviously, myself and Death Wish have only played up to the end of Chapter 3, so we, we don't know the full ins and outs of the game. But if you um, like puzzles, if you like a bit of exploration, or if you just genuinely like to play a game and see, all right, can I break it? Where can I get to? Then it's definitely worth a, a pickup. I think it's around, someone's around like 20, 20 quid, $20 at the minute on Steam. And it is available on both Steam and PlayStation 5. Yeah, uh, I can't say if it's worth 20 bucks yet or not, but I got it on sale. So, yeah. Not, not got it for free. And tell him, shh, 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 cheap bastard. If you're the typical person that's in our crowd, you're you're a puzzle fanatic, and yeah, I think you'll want to play it. Yeah, sure. So yeah. Anyway, uh, Doc, what do you got next? So it's an interesting topic that came up during that discussion. It was actually about like completion and like achievements and things. And now, as you rightly said, we are completely polar opposites when it comes to this sort of thing. Like, I think it's fair to say you're the kind of guy that will pick up a game and you'll kind of like play it for a couple of hours and then maybe never even come back to it, right? Yeah, I don't I don't know what it is. Like, even if I really enjoy a game that I'm playing and then, like, I, like say, that one, I played for a few hours and completely enjoyed it and then i'm like okay taking a break fine like i want to play it again but then it's like i I had if i if i force myself to press play and let it come up then i will play it but if i just have to get myself to press play otherwise i i I just get bored easily so that's kind of part of it so is that is that the main reason for you why you potentially don't come back to a game is that you give it a try, you decide, oh, it, it's not for me, and then sort of, like, move on to the next? Uh, no, I mean, it's like, there's there's plenty that I've I've played that, I, you know, it's like, ah, oh, great game, uh, like this one, but I, I don't think, I probably would have taken longer to get back to it if not for you playing it. Yeah, okay. And, and, and I, and... When I did get back to it, thoroughly enjoyed it. Why? I don't really know. Like I said, other than, you know, I'm not really bored with it. Yeah. It's... Do you think maybe it's like that because of the mechanics of the game and for what you can do within the game, you've got that like bit of intrigue and wonder is like, okay, I, I want to go back to this because I want to see if I can break this game and I want to see if I can get to that area where you're not meant to be going. So, in like subconsciously you kind of set yourself a bit of a challenge to kind of play the game a little bit more kind of thing yeah i mean like i mean for example prime example for me well i used to be a fps player when i first started playing games which was unreal tournament back in 1999 and some of y'all weren't even born then. <laughs> God, you the, whippersnappers. Yeah, I was in my late 20s. But uh, yeah, like, love that. I was really good. I was one of the top in the world. Yeah, but anyway, I, I just got to a point where I didn't like first-person shooters anymore. And I mean, you know, I, puzzles, I've always loved puzzles. And I joined Steam, which has been about 19 years now. 20 years is uh, right now is when they started. But yeah, uh, I got the orange box, which required you to download Steam. Yeah, all that jazz. And yeah, so uh, and the and the reason why I download uh, not download, I you know, it was still physical. I had to go to the store, Best Buy at the time, and pick up the orange box. I did say solely or it had a Half-Life 2, it had TF2, yada, 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 but it had Portal. And 
I was just from the the clips, the trailers, and things for Portal. Uh, just watching, I'm like, I have to play that. And I bought the orange box solely for that game. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I ended up playing TF2 and Half-Life. I, I went through all of it. But yeah, Portal was still my favorite. And every mod that came out and all the crap you had to go through to make them work and stuff at the time <laughs> it was just... Because Portal One's not an easy game to um, get mods running. Let's be honest; you have to, you do have to jump for a few hoops <laughs> to get there. Let's be honest. Yeah, which which I was used to, you know, back in the day. I mean, you know, whether it was Windows or whatever, I was used to having to go through that kind of stuff. Not a big deal, but yeah, you know, that was two thousand seven, I believe. Uh, then four years later, uh, Portal Two came out, two thousand eleven, I believe. And, it, and it's like, yeah, I, Valve had the whole thing where people were playing against each other, sort of, on teams within Steam to to get it and working towards a common goal, which was to get it released early. And it ended up, it, after all the work everybody did, it ended up only getting released, I believe, by like an hour earlier. <laughs> and I'm like, are you Thanks, kidding Dave. me? <laughs> but but my oldest daughter, who's twenty twenty three now, yeah, she, she back then, I mean, she was like eleven, and she she got up early with me because I had to get to work, so I was up at like six a.m. I think six a.m. is when it uh, released, and she got up early for school and started playing Portal Two. Uh, yeah, she was she was into it then, and uh, yeah, I mean I was hooked from the get go. Got off from work and just played it, and it, it was it was one I couldn't put down. And obviously for years I I, I couldn't stop playing it until the last couple of years where I just had to take a break. I, I, Things just got too much. Other things going on, and you know, kind of, kind of like you. Okay, so, so, like, let me put this to you then. Like, you, you touched on there that you was always a an FPS guy, and you spent like so many, so much time back in the day on on Unreal Tournament, and you know, there was that element of burnout. Do you feel like you reached the same sort of place with Portal Two eventually, or was it just a case of mm-hmm. let's just, you know? I'm still there. I still enjoy it. I just want to wind down a little bit, take a break. Or was it like genuine burnout, perhaps? Yeah, I think I I kept going. Even after I just ran out of ideas. Like I was, at one point I was making at least one map a day, every day. And I wasn't, out, you know, I wasn't trying to put out crap, but at the same time. I knew it was crap, but I just enjoyed doing it. So I was doing that. So are we talking like the early days of the workshop? I mean, for, as soon as the workshop released, uh, I did get a little better and I tried different things and they ended up better than what I thought they were. Uh, they ended up getting, you know, front page. I got quite a quite a few front page maps. Uh, looking back on those, I would say they're garbage now. So not to, again, and don't take this the wrong way. So would you consider that like in those early days of the community workshop, you was making so many maps in like a bid to, I don't know, popularize yourself or sort of try and no. put yourself in, in a in a place within the community as like a recognized member of the community back in those early days? Oh, not at all. No, I I literally just did it because I enjoyed making something that people played and enjoyed at the time and okay so yeah it wasn't it wasn't about making myself known or any of that stuff and and that's why even I, you know i went through a long period of time where yeah i was still making some maps but i was doing a ton of play testing and i just became a play tester and, and that's what i really enjoyed was play testing and breaking their maps which was satisfying to me, but also helpful for the map maker because 
that I was, you know, breaking it in ways, you know, they didn't want that to happen. So it made them think about, okay, how do I stop this and make better maps? And, and they did. I mean, like so many people's maps that I played, like Seven Silhouette in particular. And of course, we, we can't uh, not mention uh, Prototype, who's a great map maker and one of your first map, not your first map, but that map that you made. And yeah, I was, I was trying, I was like trying to segue onto that just uh, a moment ago, but I you know, couldn't, couldn't derail the rambling man for a moment. But yeah, the, um, it was that, that gel map and I kind of made, I made this gel map and there was three variants of it. There was a beginner, a medium and an advanced. And it just got to a point with the advanced map where it was just through <laughs> sheer principle and grit that I just carried on because every time I made a change, there you could guarantee either Deathwish or Prototype sent me a video and it's like, nah, mate, it's still broken, fix it. <laughs> and it, it just it just turned out to be this utter horrible mess <laughs> but it was just out of principle it's like you are not beating me on this one i'm gonna make it so you cannot you cannot break this map and i if i remember there was just like i think there was like grating all over the place there was fizzlers there was laser grids and it was like the most horrendous <laughs> thing you will ever see in your life oh my god yeah. it's like no and i, I think weren't, weren't we able to like version 23 of the map or something <laughs> stupid like that was that. the most fun and the thing was I, got, I gotta look at this i mean i gotta look and find it but um <laughs> okay do that uh, but like the the thing was like every everyone you posted like every update both me and prototype both broke it in different ways <laughs> so it was like we were breaking the map every single time and uh, two different ways every update <laughs> yeah, it was like it was like okay death push sent me a video he's broken it i fixed it literally you would publish that update and then straight in off the conveyor belt here's a new video from prototype <laughs> he's broken it another way and it's just like dear god um <laughs> somehow that map has got uh 29 <laughs> ratings positive ratings i have no idea how <laughs> hey but no, I I've looking at the revision history here. There is there was fourteen updates to it. I'm just sort of like looking back at the comments, like oh thanks to everybody who's played the map, thanks to the feedback and comment. I'm guarantee if I look at the end of this, like for fuck's sake, I'm gonna fix this. We stop fucking breaking my map. <laughs> yeah, oh. that, that, that's like seven silhouette too. But I think that map in particular with with you was my favorite because it was it was not about not just about breaking your map it was about outdoing prototype and vice versa yeah but, but we we kept doing it and i i'd say we as far as i can remember we tied i mean they were just it was just that way as far as you can remember you two tied while i was sat in the corner rocking having a nervous <laughs> breakdown yeah in the fetal position and then, you know, Seven Silhouette, those of you who played his maps, uh, yeah, I was I was his number one playtester to start. And then he would I would break it. I, I broke for so many years. Every single map he made, I broke. And then he would update and I would break it again. And I would just even if I knew what the attendant solution was or what I thought it was. I would try to find a way that th that was not intended. Yep. Yeah. It was, it was a lot, a lot of breaking happening. And that, that was probably where I got my most satisfying thing was play testing maps and breaking them. Yeah. Like the, the, the winter testing initiative back in the day that was like basically a Christmas theme. Yeah. I remember that one very well. Yeah, I, I mean, I play tested the crap out of that and broke it in different areas. And of course, I also did. Uh, unfortunately, the playthrough video I did, uh, my YouTube account got banned. 
for, for, for reasons we'll never know why. Yeah, it is what it is. But, but yeah, uh, it was just, it just became a new fun thing for me to do. Uh, it was just break people's maps, which, which I also looked at as a helpful thing, you know? Yeah. I mean, there, there is always the helpful thing because I think with, with any, um, game or map, you know, play testing and getting feedback and seeing what's broken and being able to fix it is definitely like a, an important part. Cause not only do you identify those issues, you also, like you rightly said before, you're trying to encourage the creator to refine their process and, you know, almost ultimately get better at what they are doing. Obviously it's been spoken about many times in the community before though, unfortunately that um, it's not always met that way. And, you know, some people kind of take it the wrong way, especially with, I think a lot of the, the front page maps and the front page map yeah, makers. Personal. Yeah. There's a lot of people who aren't open to any form of, of criticism. They kind of see it as, a, as an attack against themselves. So, well, yeah, I mean, you know, you got some trolls and you got people who are like, this is garbage, blah, blah, blah. No, that's, I always try to be constructive. With, yeah with the with the criticism yeah i mean there there is there's there's definitely two types of criticism there is the the criticism that is constructive and you're trying to help them and offer some um value with your comments and then there's the others that are just like yeah no rubbish no nah, shit nah don't bother playing good examples uh that i can think of just off the top of my head are like crazy attack he took the criticism fine, but he didn't kind of like he didn't really listen to what he was told. And then there was Alfie Five, uh, Alfie Five, Orcus maps and all that stuff. And he was a typical beginner starting to make maps and using typical stuff. And then you know he learned and actually started coming up with some really good maps. Uh, and then I also work with uh, some other people, you know, uh, since then, and, you know, kind of in cahoots working together to make a map, and uh, they were quite good. So, yeah, I mean, uh, and I say, like, crazy, he his maps got better as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's, I'd say I'm, I'm the, the, I have ideas and I just can't make them happen. I'm the idiot out of the bunch. Yeah, I mean, I, I can totally relate to that. I mean, I... I'm the ID10T. <laughs> <laughs> I can totally relate to that. I mean, I'm I'm a, I'm a absolute sod for, like, wanting to try new things. And I'm a typical, like, jack-of-all-trades, master of none. So I will try my hand at anything to try and like broaden my horizons. And I think anybody who's been around in, in the community for a long time will know very well that, you know, I, I kind of dabble in bits and pieces and then, you know, I kind of fail off from projects or I, you know, move on to the next thing sort of thing. And I think like to go back to kind of like where you were saying about like getting burnt out with the first person shoot I I kind of... I mean, and I've openly spoken about this before to people. I kind of had the same sort of thing with Portal 2 and Effect. So as everybody knows, I kind of like tried to offer a service, I guess, I, I for lack of a better description of, you know, playing the maps as, as many people do. And obviously, you know, I, I ran a map queue and I would kind of like ask for requests. People would send them in. I would play the maps. And it kind of, it was it was okay, and then it kind of got to a point where I'd cleared down the map queue and I played a good chunk of the maps. And this is you know this is no disrespect to any map makers because I think a lot of the map makers who I play maps from a regular basis are absolutely fantastic and have some great creative ideas. But it was getting yeah. to a state where the maps that I was constantly coming up against were so Extremely difficult so difficult they were yeah. taking me like multiple days at a time or multiple streams at a time and like to spend say two three four days on a map then go straight into another one which is like another two three four days to solve it just 
completely ground me down. And, you know, I had to, I had to walk away. It was as simple as that. I, it was, yeah. it, I was just, all I was doing with my spare time was playing Portal, trying to solve these difficult maps. And it was just one battle after the next. When you're playing maps like that, which are taking such a long time, and because of the way I'm playing them, like so disjointedly, so I'm like playing for a block of two to three hours, having a break of between 24 or 72 hours, then coming back to it. You don't have that like nice flow of, you know, okay, this is what I'm doing. You have to spend that extra bit of time at the beginning of the next session thinking, okay, so what was I doing last time? Yeah. What have I already tried? What can I try differently? And for me, you know, I, I again, openly admit, I, I tend to think about myself that I don't have a very good short-term memory so for me it's really difficult to get back into that groove of what was i doing where am i going what can i do next and yeah it just yeah. got to, it just got to a point where i was just really really ground down and, and i had to step away and i did like take a break and i kind of stepped away for i think it was initially for about like three maybe four months i stepped away from portal two and then i came back to it but I don't know, it was just, it was more of the same. It was just like constant hard maps and hard maps. And don't get me wrong, I am dedicated and I will I will sit in front of a computer and I will bang my head against the wall until I'm pouring with blood if, it, if that's what it takes to solve something and do something. I mean, you've you've been around for a long time, Deathwish, like in my streams. Yeah, and, yeah. You, know, you, you definitely got that, you got that over me because I'll just be like, okay, I, I see what needs to be done. Uh, this is going to take more time to figure out. I, I kind of had the attitude of, I just got to the point to where, okay, I'm tired of the hard maps. Like if it, if it took me longer than 20, 30 minutes, then I'm like, okay, I, I, I don't want to let it beat me. But at the same time, I'm like, I, I just don't care enough to finish it. I, I mean, I think the maps were good, but it just, so many of the maps became basically the same map over and over again because they had the, they had the same style the all like so many used lasers redirection cubes light bridges funnels but they weren't used in any new way it was just like taking a hard map and remixing it into a different map with the same exact stuff yeah and 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 that turned me off so i just stopped playing this even though by design and the thought that went into them and everything was i think was great i just i, I got tired of it yeah and i mean i i don't i'm not just necessarily talking about like portal 2 maps here either i mean you know again because you know you used to kind of like co-host the streams with me and used to be on pretty much all the time but i mean how many times have i played games and you've been sat there and i've kind of like just doing the like stupidest of things just because you know i i, I don't know let's, let's take let's take the witness freaking the the puzzle in the witness as a prime example when i was playing the witness man like seriously how many times I went through that and how many times I should have probably just say, you know what? Fuck it. I, this, this is difficult, but that's not my nature. And I'm just a stubborn bastard when it comes down to things like that. And I will, like I say, I will sit here and bang my head up against the wall until it bleeds. If that's what it takes just to freaking say I've done it because I'm that sort of person. I'm determined. And yeah. one of my, greatest you, pleasure you have the patience of a saint yeah it's not just the patience but one of my greatest pleasures in computing in computer games is to say you know what i sat here and i did it i mean a, a, yeah. prime, a prime example right recently i've been playing final fantasy 8 on steam and i finished the game i mean I've, I've started a second playthrough to go through and do the achievements now there is one achievement in that game which is kill 10,000 enemies, right? 10,000 enemies during your playthrough. <laughs> now, considering you get somewhere between one and four enemies in a random battle for each encounter, you can kind of guess how long it's going to take, right? 
Yeah, that's that, that's just ridiculous. That's not something. That's something I wouldn't go for. Yeah. So of course, stubborn old knock over here. It's like, no, I'm going to do this. So yeah. the game has a a high speed where you can like speed up the engine and it plays a little bit quicker. I finally finished it at the beginning of this week, and I looked at my save file because I, I split it out into a separate save file. So. I worked out that it took me 45 hours of game game time just to get 10,000 kills. Damn. Yeah, no, what, no just for way. Just one single achievement, which is completely yeah, ridiculous. No way I would do that. And, you know, I, I could have probably just, uh, you know, a lot of people have just said, nah, mate, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to load up Steam Achievement Manager and I'm going to click that button. Yeah, Job good done. old Sam. But, <laughs> again, I, I don't feel like I've earn the achievement if i use sam oh no well you didn't so to go back onto the original point because i am that like stubborn sob um i don't didn't really want to kind of abandon these difficult maps and i know for a fact and i i kind of i kind of ignore it at the time but i know when i'm playing a different a difficult map and i'm there and i'm concentrating you know you're you're on there as like my co co streaming with me and it's like I'm concentrating away, and then all of a sudden you'll hear this uh, you'll hear this sarcastic comment come from this American guy who's like, <laughs> wow, if I was playing this, I would have given up half an hour ago. Jeez, I can't <laughs> believe this guy's still playing it. And it's like, I know, and I completely understand what you're saying, but yeah, I, I just can't. But because I am like that, and I, I don't want to let people down, and I don't want to give up, and I want to see something through, it's like, it's not sustainable. I cannot sustain playing these maps anymore. And, and you know, ultimately, yeah. that's I, I was just burnt out. And you know, other things, as I, I'm not going to go into, but obviously other things happened this year, which kind of put a lot yeah. of things into perspective for me. And, right. you know, since then, I've kind of I put down on the streams. So I kind of only stream once a week now. Sometimes I do it twice. But... I kind of find that I have a lot more time to do other things. So like I have yeah. like Wednesday night is like my main stream night where I'm currently playing through the entire Kingdom Hearts collection for some God knows on, on yeah, for some God knows reason. Um, <laughs> Thursday nights is like something I've never done, like haven't done for years, but like Thursday nights now a dedicated night where I can like sit down with some of my old uni mates and we just like, Play a bit of like Call of Duty Warzone, and we just like run around shouting and screaming at each other, getting really frustrated with each other. But you know, again, because in the past I was playing so much Portal and I was tied to it, it's it's like little things like that that I've never, I, I haven't done for years. So having that like release and that freedom yeah. is, is really good for me. I mean, you know, if 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 I was still stuck in Portal, you know, we probably wouldn't be sat here right now doing this. Yeah, we would have been sat in front of my computer a few months. You know, you trying to like help me out on like the the music track, which you know, I'll, I'll be honest, we still need to go back to and finish that. But yeah, you know, yeah that little, was, little things, that like, was fun. Little but, things yeah. like that. You know, I just it just the little things that I, I couldn't do before. You know, realizing that burnout and realizing not all is cracked up to be, and maybe you need to take a step back and look at things with a bit of a a wider lens it's definitely helpful not just for yourself and uh, but you know for yeah, yeah it's definitely helpful definitely no, no i mean yeah i think you said that beautifully uh you, i've always had mad respect for your you know just sticking with things the patience and yeah i think you only had that one hawk moment <laughs> which is a classic and and I can't I can't blame you, but God, if it was me, yeah, it it would have been completely different. Yet, like your patience, your your ability to focus, and your ability to just keep going and get it done is second to none. Yeah, I mean, I've 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 been doing I th I don't know the exact day, but I think I've been doing YouTube for like. 12, 13 years possibly um twitch came a little bit later 
And I think I can honestly say in like that whole kind of 13 year period, there's only ever been one time where I, it has completely got the better of me and I have lost my shit in that witness moment. But over the years, I've kind of like developed a way of just almost not getting mad with things, but like laughing things off. Yeah. And I, I think that that definitely helps like being able to laugh things off rather than let them get under your skin and, and get frustrated with them. Definitely, if I couldn't do that, then, you know, I probably wouldn't be as as dedicated to a cause as I normally am. So, yeah, I think it's, you know, a lot of it comes down to my ability to just being able to take a step back, have a laugh about it, laugh it off, let's get back on with it sort of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, um, that was quite a long, drawn-out conversation considering it was like, okay, you're this sort of guy and I'm this sort of guy. I think, I don't know, that that's conversation's gone on for a lot longer than I anticipated. Where should we go next? How about, off the top of my head, I think something completely different from games and everything else, you know, that we've basically been on games, so. Yeah, we've had like an hour, hour on computer games, so maybe, you know, change, changing up the subject. Yeah, so I, I'm kind of going towards, I, I've been watching a lot of, I mean, I watch a lot of videos. Uh, I have my subscriptions subscribed to drag races and, you know, this, that, the other, just real, real manly stuff. <laughs> uh, completely different things. Cook some cooking. I mean, you know, you suck at cooking. The dude that makes everything from scratch out in the woods. People knew who I'm talking about. Yeah, and the only guy that comes to mind is like, I don't know if you're familiar with him, or if he's just like a UK guy, but Bear Grylls. Oh, uh, no, I'm talking about YouTube. Okay. He's well known. He, he stopped putting out as many videos, and then he's recently been putting out more videos again. He, he'll, he'll like make furnaces and I mean, you name it and my short-term and long-term memory sucks so don't feel bad <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean i can picture his face it's dang it and I'm, I'm sure people would know who i'm talking about where i mean he literally dude is dude is a beast like i mean you can see that's what he does it's not fake he doesn't speak. He just has camera set up and they'll switch him and he makes bricks out of clay. He'll take water from a creek and mud and mix sand and clay and everything together. And then he'll, he'll, he'll make a, a freaking oven with it, like a furnace and, and then you know, start fire and he starts fire from, you know, he doesn't use matches or any of that. Like everything is straight up natural. Let me go to a resource you call Google. Right? Google? What's that? I've never heard of it. Yeah, I know, right? That's something you put on your face to like help you see things better? Google? Google's maybe? Yeah. Uh actually Google is a is a number. Is it? Yeah. If you look up the definition look up the definition of Google. All right, I got I gotta look for this real quick. Let's look up a Google. Go I'm going to Google a Google. Yep. It's actually a thing. Well, you Google a Google and all you see is Google. So um, let me look at Google definition. Apparently, Google means to search for information about someone or something on the internet. There's got to be another definition there, is there? Yeah, it has, it has to do with math. Okay. Ah, first recorded in 1998 after the after math mathematical term Google. Okay, yeah. so it's spelled slightly different. So it's a number that is equal to one followed by 100 zeros and expressed as 10100. Okay. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's where the name actually came from. Uh, I could be wrong. I'm sure somebody would let us know. But G O G G E L, right? Or G O G O O G E O. Yeah, so it's um, G O O G O L, and it's uh, I've got the, yeah, the, yeah, the word yeah. story for Google here. Founded in 1998, the website Google.com has become such an institution that its short existence has changed not only the way we process and data found online, but also the way we think and talk about the internet. The term Google itself is a creative spelling of Google, 
a number equal to 10 to the 100th power or more colloquially an unfathomable number google was coined in the 1930s and attributed to a nine-year-old nephew of american mathema mathematician edward kasner soon after google was created the trademark company became a popular verb people were googling all sorts of information including their own names when users google themselves unless their names are absurdly rare they may find their google gangers or their namesakes listed in the google search engine interesting i i didn't know that so every day is uh Every day is a school day. Yeah, uh, I'm always about learning new things. Yes, I mean you're you're quite um, you're quite savvy with your uh, words and and everything, Deathwish. So I mean, what, what sort of drives your like word interest, so to speak? Obviously, I know um, we I know for a fact that you know you play a lot of um, wordscapes. Yeah, you know you've been playing that for years. Obviously, uh, I've been playing for three years and tournament. Is about to start in 15 minutes, but I tend to pick my times so that I've got, I've gotten pretty quick. I've actually, my cell phone at the bottom of the screen, uh, even though I have a top of the line Android S22 Ultra, you know, Galaxy uh, Gorilla Glass, which uh, iPhones don't have. I've actually played it so much that it's just from swiping it's done micro scratches in it <laughs> to where it's kind of cloud. Yeah, it's nuts. But I've gotten I've gotten to where like last last weekend I, I couldn't play until because I was out of town and I couldn't really play until Sunday. And I had to start on Saturday in case I didn't wake up in time to start. Because if, if you start on Sunday, you got to start in the morning. Otherwise, you can't get into the tournament. Right. Okay. So I just did one level to get in. And then I was like, you know, Sunday, I was like a 60 something or whatever uh, out of 100. And then I started playing. Uh, we were behind team wise. And I brought our team from 8,000 to uh, behind to within 500. And I went. To the top of my single player and then they started getting like faster and faster somehow like they, they started coming back uh, so when i got back home they were eight thousand ahead again because i hadn't played and yeah yada yada and then got to where we were going back and forth between number one and number two every single time i'm like and i i pr i was doing for an hour, I got over 2,500 words in an hour. Okay. And yeah, and I was like, okay, that, that was at the end. And I was like, okay, I'm done. Like finger hurts, brain hurts, done. But what, what drives me on those, just kind of... Sorry to cut you off, but you know, Rambling Man cuts me off before I even finish my question. Oh, yeah. Um, so obviously, like I said, I you're you're quite a formidable word wordscapes player, and people in the community also will recognise, you know, the the word or player in you as well. You know, you you've got quite a reputation in our community for like your streak that you went on in World, which was like over five hundred days without like missing a word. So yeah, everybody kind of recognises you as as quite a word guy. But yeah, what I really want to know is like where does that kind of like interest and um ability to think about the words and like come up with the words and see the words almost um come from like is it something that you kind of like developed as a kid you've always been naturally gifted with words honestly that's where i was actually gonna go but i went off on a tangent and was rambling so <laughs> but now where it comes from is i was terrible at english in school well not that i was terrible but i hated it okay I hated English class and I just did whatever just to get by. I mean, I was pretty much a straight A student. I had, I had college classes and college credits for classes in high school for, you know, so, like science and math in particular, which, which I loved and English was not one of them. So as I got older to answer that question more directly without rambling, 
too much more. As I got older, I've, I've really strived to try to, I was, I, I, I actually, I was always, I won spelling bee after spelling bee after spelling bee. Okay. And, uh, so I was always good at that, but I wasn't really good with the whole breaking down sentence structures and this, that, the other. So I kind of started like probably a 20 years ago, like when I was 30, early thirties and trying to learn more and really started getting into the English language and learning more words. And I used to play a lot of uh, Scrabble with the neighbor. Okay. Yeah. Who was from, who, who was from uh, uh, the UK. Okay. So, so I right, just to, just to pause. So what I, what I really want to know now is, did you use proper words or did you use American words? We went by her Scrabble dictionary. Okay. That, that kind of skirts the question a little bit. I want to know, you know, proper words or made up American words. No, there, there's no, you can't use slang. You can't use proper words. You can't use, you know, you know any of that stuff. So it had to be just general words, no proper names, no places. No... Okay. Proper Scrabble rules then. Yeah, absolutely. Gosh, she was adamant about that. So yeah, she kicked my ass, but I was probably, I think I was about 11, 12 when I started playing her and she was probably at least in her forties and she had the greatest English accent. Loved it. What better than mine? Ah, I mean, I, th I think y'all kind of have the same, I, I can't remember where she's from. Yeah. She, I, I think y'all have the same, uh, a very similar accent from what I can remember. And that depends on what, what knock you get. I mean, you know, I'm, yeah. I, I'm a man of yeah. man of many <laughs> British accents, shall we say, <laughs> you know, like, like where where I'm from, I'm when I'm home, I'm kind of like like now I I'll kind of like slang talk to people, but then for those of you that don't know, I work down near London, so I spend quite a lot of time down London and, and the area. But I do find like when I go down there, I speak completely different, and like I have more. Yeah. Of, I mean, you you probably feel like I have like a quite a, a proper English accent, but. When I go down to Essex, I'm got an even more proper British accent. Yeah, well, I haven't heard that side from you, really. So, well, if you, if you want me to speak proper, then I I will definitely speak proper. You know, I, okay. I just like yeah. you kind of like <laughs> take your time a little bit more with the pronunciations, and you kind of like pronounce yeah. words. You're enunciating everything. Yeah, but I mean, then 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 you fall into the whole kind of like north south debate where, you know. We say up here, you know, I'm I'm going to go and sit on the grass. I'm going to go take a bath. And you go down south, and it's like you're going to go sit on the grass. You're going to have a bath. It's like no, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't pronounce my R's. There's, there's, there's no R in bath. It's not bath. It's not B A R T H. It's bath. I'm having a bath, not a bath. So uh, yeah, then you sort of like yeah. falling into those sort of pitfalls. But you know, it's like you can like go. 20, 30 minutes down the road and they'll be speaking completely different. Some places you go to in the UK, you just have no idea what they're saying unless you are from the area. My wife used to have a friend um, who was a, a Geordie. So that's like Newcastle, Sunderland, Durham sort of area. And um, she always used to say when she was on a night out and the more she drank, her friend drank, the less she could understand her. And if she was out yeah. with her mate from back home as well, you, you got not a chance in hell of understanding what they are saying. Like, <laughs> it should just sound like that. It's like, just like a, a constant rambling mumble. And it's like, how you can process what you are saying <laughs> is just beyond me. I'm trying to rein us back in a bit more on topic of the question that I actually asked, rather than you know, going off on all these tangents. <laughs> You're the rambling man, not me. <laughs> yeah. Hey. You, you you can't call me the, the soul rambling man anymore. You, I have rubbed off on you, and you are now the British rambling man. The British rambling man. We actually have accents over here in the Northeast, uh, like especially with Boston accents, New York and stuff. Like you go to, uh, uh, it, well, it's kind of British, but with a different, but different from like a, a British 
person's standpoint. Like that northeast of America is very much like a like an an Italian American kind of accent, if that makes sense. Like, hey, I'm walking here. Like kind of like what they like taught with like a yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's a, it's a big mixture. Yeah, you park you park your car going to the mall. Yeah, and it varies. Uh, you can have very similar sounding, uh, and that's kind of what I wanted to actually transition into is differences between because I've been watching so many videos from Germans and Europe in general, and as well as UK, the differences between the US and Europe. I think it's I think it's quite interesting. Hey, so are you talking about like just like things in general as opposed to like accents and and stuff or oh yeah just just like things in general like uh bathrooms like we don't have and of course i don't know where but like like uh i'll just speak of europe in in general so like certain places i know in europe you have to pay for public bathrooms uk being well, not everywhere in the UK is like that, but you know, I hold my hand up. The town I live in are very much like that. Like, you know, you go, you go to the, you go down the park. I mean, my my town is is pretty run down. There's not a lot in my town. Uh, I think we have like two sets of public toilets, maybe three that they've, they've shut all the others down. But yeah, literally, you go in there and it's like twenty p or fifty p. You have to pay as you go in to use the public bathrooms, which I I can kind of understand why they do it because they're kind of thinking, okay, we need to make sure we maintain these facilities, which, you know, I get. But on the flip side of that, A, my tax I pay my council should really cover public services, so why am I paying again? But B, all it, all you ever see at the public bathrooms is one person's paying, and then a massive queue of about 20 people following them in. So... <laughs> <laughs> there's no real point in like trying to charge everybody to use like the public bathrooms because like there's one door on, on like it's literally like a door on the front of the building and then as soon as that door's open everybody piles in so it's like that 20p goes around like it's probably like works out like they're getting like one p one p per person of everybody <laughs> using the freaking bathroom yeah say so over here we do not have pay toilets period like like you can be driving down the road and go, oh, I need to take a pee. And you go, oh, there's a 7 Eleven. Uh, there's uh, Wendy's or Taco Bell or in, in any public kind of place, even though they're privately owned, but they're public. You can go in, do your business, and leave without buying anything. Not everywhere is like that. There are genuinely places you can go and lots of places you can go in the UK where. You know, you can just go in and use the facilities, you know, service stations on motorways, for, for example. You know, you, you just pull over, you take a piss, you're back in your car, off you, off you go again. So, you know, yeah. there are plenty of public facilities. The one place, though, that really drives me scranny, that charges f to use the, the toilets, is train stations. There is nothing worse than going on a train somewhere. Let's say I, I go on the train to London, which is a ball lake in itself because I live miles away from public transport, so it's always an arsehole to get there, but I digress. You've been on a train for, let's say, I don't know, hour, hour and a half. For whatever reason, you've not used facilities on the train. You've got your kids with you. You get off the train. First thing you want to do, I need a piss. Okay. Uh, that costs you 50p. It's like... No, it drives me scrawny. I've just spent the last hour and a half on a train. I haven't been to the toilet. I don't know. The, the toilet's blocked and backed up and nobody can go in there. So, you know, the, the, there's been some guy <laughs> in there vomiting the whole time or, you know, there's a couple of teenagers in there getting off of each other, like, the whole journey. I've just spent the last hour and a half. I've finally rocked up at this train station and now you want me to freaking pay. And in, in like a society where cash is becoming like less and less common and everything is going to digital, it's like, well, I haven't got a fucking 20p in my pocket. I ain't got 50p in my pocket. What am I supposed to do now? It's, yeah, th there is nothing that frustrates, there is nothing that frustrates me more than like traveling a long distance and then like you really need to go to the bathroom, but you can't because you have to pay. It just drives me scranny. Yeah, I don't get it. Another thing is, because we, we don't have that here. You come here, 
you can go to the bathroom, you know, anywhere. Nobody's going to stop you. Well, you mean in your own house? And you just a random stranger come up into your house and say, oh, by the way, I need the, the I need to use the jump. Oh, I mean, act, actually, to be honest, I mean, that's not common, but there's been situations where, depending on where you are, you can literally go up to somebody's, uh, a complete stranger's house, knock on their door, and be like, I'm sorry, you know, can can I use your phone or I, I really need to get at a bathroom? Would you mind? That's not common, but it, it does happen just because, you know, depending on where you are. So yeah. taking a switch from that, I think the biggest difference is air conditioning where like, like here, air conditioning, it, it, it's everywhere. Like wherever yeah. you go, it, you have heat and AC, HVAC, and in your cars, and everywhere else. And I've heard of like people in Europe in general will literally not like they're against AC. Don't have window units even, much less. It's just you open your windows up, and y'all have well, at least in uh, Germany and certain other places have some really cool windows that you turn. You turn the thing straight up, and it opens from the top to gap it, and yeah. then you shut it, and then turn it to the right, and then it opens like a door, and that sort of thing. We don't have that. Our slide up and down. And yeah, you can tilt them in and out uh, for cleaning purposes and stuff like that, but yeah, well, we also have screens, which... Uh, apparently is not super common in Europe. Okay. As far as, as, far as uh, that, we have screens so that bugs aren't flying in when we open our windows. I, I know exactly what you mean, because from like watching American TV, you kind of like have a, like a, an outside, thinking about your front door, you have like a door outside of your door and the door yeah, kind of like has a, like a, a mesh a storm kind door. Of thing. It, 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 it protects your main door from the elements. So you can open your main door up, and that it could be solid wood, it could be aluminum, steel, fiberglass, whatever. But you have a storm door so that it blocks rain blowing on it, and yeah, all that. It just protects the main door, and the storm doors are typically always aluminum or aluminium. That's better. Speak proper. But, yeah, no, nah, actually, I prefer that because that's, we say, aluminum over here because of a discrepancy uh, because aluminum or aluminium was invented in the UK. Yep. And it was published on a paper and it was misspelled and then it became aluminum. But, you know, you got plutonium. You know, it's a, you know, all the erniums and stuff like aluminium, but they misspelled it in the paper. So that's how we ended up having the word aluminum. Yeah. But yeah, AC is like a huge thing here. So that's why we don't have the kind of windows that are in Europe. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak for like the majority of mainland europe i've been to a fair few places but i you know i'm i'm not massively traveled in europe i've done you know france multiple times spain switzerland greece turkey i mean in like mainstream holiday locations and ac is like really it's it's standard and, and pretty common but i would say that probably because a lot of climates in europe are traditionally cooler then AC isn't something that we naturally have in buildings. So yeah, I, th I, I feel like that's a big part of it, you know, where if, if we lived in like a bit further, a bit, I don't know, some parts of Europe are in the equator, but if we were more south and, and nearer to the equator and our traditional climate was warmer, then potentially it would be more common practice. I mean, I think in modern day, more people are starting to install air conditioning units and systems into their houses over here, uh, whether that's just like a knock-on effect of, you know, the, the way of the world and you know, with climate change and, and yeah. temperatures and everything starting to uh, to increase. I don't know. But 
you, you do find uh, it is g getting more common practice. I mean, I've got just like a standalone AC unit here. Not that I ever use it because it makes a hell of a freaking noise and I haven't really got anywhere to properly vent it. But, I, you know, even office buildings sometimes, they don't have built-in aircon. They just have like these standalone units that you would probably, I don't know, normally put on a balcony or something and then feed the pipe in through a, a window slot or something. So, uh, yeah, I mean, wow. you know, we're, we're not prepared or equipped for however which is probably why you see so many brits complaining when we do get a bit of nice weather you know you, typical brits you know you, you can't can't please us when it's pissing it down with rain and you can't please us even when it's fucking scorching hot and not raining so you know we just like to moan about everything what can i say yeah i think i, th I think that's uh depending on what you're talking about it kind of covers everywhere pretty much but yeah i mean here it's pretty unusual not to have an hvac system where you have like like my house i have uh, natural gas for heat hot water whatever you know you want for heat and then a typical air conditioning unit which both are only i had to replace both of them a few years ago just to cut you off there quickly, quickly like a, a hvac system is that like um is that like a heat pump then does that kind of like replace like the need for natural gas is that what that is or uh, no, H, hvac is just a term for you know heating and air conditioning so like the house i lived in that i was renting like back in 2000 and 2004 the heating system was fuel which was like a step below uh diesel as far as refinement uh, so yeah it was a it was a liquid and and you had a furnace and it would burn the liquid whereas here i have natural gas way more efficient way hotter and it heats everything up way quicker Okay. And and then the air condition uh, uses the same blower, just like a cylindrical fan inside the furnace. It blows through all of the ducts. Yeah. And the AC unit is outside. The part that the coolant, so to speak, goes through, and it has a fan blowing up and blows all the hot air out cools cools the line off as it returns back in so you're getting rid of um you know humidity and heat at the same time which you know ac does naturally but yeah and, and it's everywhere though like no matter where you go businesses or houses everywhere you go it'll be air conditioned yeah there is no hmm i'm not going there because yeah, that place doesn't have air conditioning. But uh, anyway, yeah, so it's it's like that. And then speaking of which, I'll try to switch it up because I think that's covered enough. But like restaurants, we get free refills. Refills on like things like water, tea, coffee, soda, whatever. Now, of course, you don't get free refills on anything like beer or liquor. That would be insane. Yeah. <laughs> come come to america we give you free real refills and alcohol and you get <laughs> smashed for the price of a pint yeah. watch every freaking bar in the whole entire country go under within like the space of a week yeah pretty much <laughs> well yeah so they got that you got that going on uh but yeah everything else like you get tea or coffee or so it is at a restaurant, they keep your drinks topped off and you don't have to ask. They see your drink as low. Yeah. They come by you see, I think that's and fill it up. I, I think that's like a it's an observation I've made multiple times where I see how the hospitality industry works in America. And the the guys in that industry work a damn sight harder than they do over here. I mean for here, it's like you go to a restaurant oh, yeah. and it's like, okay, can I can I can I get like a a soda or something? I'll use American terms. Can I get a, like a soda? Yeah, that's fine. That's like I don't know, two pound, three pound, whatever it is for a freaking soda. But then you know, every time you want a soda, it's like two or three pound every single freaking time. 
I, I took me, me yeah. and Katie and took the kids um, out beginning of last month. We had like a family get together. We was all drinking. We was all drinking soda, and literally a round of sodas came to thirteen pound fifty for four drinks. That's that's Jeez. soda. That's, that's not even alcohol, and that is not even refillable. I mean, some places do do like a, a refillable option. There's there's no logic in it at all. They'll say, okay, you'll go to the bar and they'll go, um, you know, can I have a soda, please? And they're like, okay, so do you want a regular soda or do you want a refillable one? Well, it's a bit of a dumb question, surely. Surely you're always going to go for the refillable. But yeah, like you say, there is then an extra, like, I don't know, between 50p and a pound extra on the price of a regular drink. Now, it's not a big thing because if you, as long as you have more than one drink, you are obviously getting your money's worth. But just like, yeah, the, 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 the price of like soft drinks in the, in the UK in most pubs and restaurants is, absolutely insane i think the last time i went down to the pub with my mate we both like we both had a pint and i think the charge i mean i don't go down the pub very often anyway so i can't really comment what is normal and what's not but they were charging something like nearly five pound a pint which is inflated even more when you go down to london because obviously everything the furthest the further you get to london the more everything goes up and, and the more everything costs anyway yeah thinking back to last year when my football team, we, we got to Wembley. Uh, we had a cup final in Wembley. But they were charging £8 a pint in Wembley Stadium. I mean, Jesus. and that was for Budweiser. That was oh flat God. as shit because it was coming out of a tap. And it was, yeah, it's just like, I, I get I'm going to London. I get that I'm going to pay and um, spend more money because obviously costs more in London. But it's just ridiculous, you know, the, the sort of prices that, yeah, you don't get you don't get flat beer here. Tap uh, draft beer is the you way go to go. To, like I can guarantee you go to pretty much any like sports stadium in this country, and you ask for a beer, and it comes out of a freaking shitty pump tap, which I guarantee you nine times out of ten will have no head on it and it'll be as flat as shit. And then you're spending, you're you're paying like yeah. five, six, seven pound a pop for a fucking for the privilege of drinking flat, shitty beer. Uh, well, I can say that, yeah. Anytime you go to like a baseball stadium, a football stadium, whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, basketball, any kind of any kind of show, whatever. They don't allow outside food or drink. You have to buy it inside if you want it. So a lot of people, if if they're drinking. If they're going to, they drink before they get there so that they'll just buy one or two while yeah, they're there, yeah. you know. And But I have to say, uh, yeah, it's the same. It's way more expensive. Like, you'll pay, you know, $5. I mean, I, I, and I, and I, get, I get that I, I don't go to these sorts of places, like sports events and things, expecting not to pay more money. I get it, you know, they... They're not. They're not just supplying yeah. the product. They're paying the like the hundreds of staff that they employ there to like run all the concessions and, and like kiosk stands and things. And they've got oh, all yeah. their overheads oh, and yeah. everything. But you know, just to charge that much and like provide a shitty product is just. But you know, you know, as as much to say that, who's the silly mugs that are still doing it? Who's the silly mugs that are still buying it? It's like the whole. Uh, and yep. I don't mean to like go full circle on like the whole gaming thing, but it's like. It's the whole thing of like microtransactions and DLCs in computer games. It's like they're a waste of fucking money, yeah. but who makes it culture and who makes it, who, who gives yeah. the developers the okay to do it and the green light to, to keep charging us and, and wanting to spend this money? Well, uh, as long as people, yeah, as long as people spend the money, they're going to do it. As consumers, as long as we're still putting our hands in our pocket and buying, you know, spending. 15 quid on a, a skin for Call of Duty that turns your character into a cat, the more we do it, the more they're going to do it. <laughs> you, you laugh, but seriously, last two oh, months I ago, know. there was I a know. skin in Warzone which turns your character into a cat, and they were charging 16 quid for it. 16 <laughs> quid. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah. But, but yeah, if, if people pay for it, like over here, same thing. And that purchases or ads or both, you know, it's like, okay, the majority of people do not 
spend the money the it's the the one the like one or two percent of people that play the games that spend the money and they spend a lot of money i mean you have some in-betweens that it might buy the ad free version of it yep. so like a one-time purchase but you got a very small minority who keep buying like coins or gems or whatever the hell it is and they just spend literally hundreds thousands of you know hundreds of dollars thousands of dollars and that sort of thing and that's who they're targeting and it works and that's why they keep doing it and because they make enough off of that small minority to keep doing it and then the rest of the people who are watching ads and they're making money yeah. off of that and you know and if anybody clicks on one to download a game they make a little more off of it yeah so i think it's i think it's just like it's, it's modern day culture though as well in a, in a certain extent because i feel like target audience for this sort of thing is kids because oh, these yeah, 100%. The, the 100%. game companies know that even though their game's got a 15 or an 18 rating on it you know all the kids are playing it and it's the kids that are driving this you know this, this market whereby you know we're going to develop a game we're going to strip 75 percent of the, the game content out of it before we sell it to you at 660 quid then we're going to like drip feed you little bits of the game for an extra 10 pound every month and before you know it like six, a 60 pound game has actually cost you like 150 pound and then we're gonna every every week we're gonna bring out a new skin to make your character look different yeah because why wouldn't you want to make your character look like a cat i mean you know let's let's face it everybody wants to look like a cat right but <laughs> it, it's interesting though because as much as i say like it is younger people that are driving this market and driving this behavior I was having a conversation with somebody the other night and they were actually saying, you know, they have a friend who's in a school environment. So they, they work in a school. Um, I don't know if they're a teacher or if they just have sort of some other p position within the school. But they're saying, like, it's that much of, like, a culture with, within kids now. Kids are using it to, like, it's like the new thing for kids to get one up over somebody else. Yeah, but the, the parents are allowing it. And the the parents are the ones that are putting their credit card info or whatever on the apps. It's like don't do it. Just because don't it's do because it. like it, play the game, watch watch. It's because parents are. It's a bit different. I, I, you know, I, I'm not like standing on my high horse here and saying you know I'm above everybody else, but I do feel like I have an advantage over a lot of other people because I'm like loosely in industry and I know how these things work, but. It's a naivety of parents who don't understand computer games and they don't understand how these things work. So, you know, their, their kid just comes up to them yeah. and says, oh, there's this new thing from a game, can I have it? And their kids, the parents are like, yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And they're, they're the ones that are reinforcing this behavior because, I mean, and I've had it with like Evan right here. He's like, he comes up to me and he's like, oh can i get the new skin for fortnite or can i get this for apex legends it's like 16 quid i was like no because you're not spending yeah. that money on changing the look of your character and then to go back to like the school comment like he'll, he'll go off and then you'll hear him and he, he's getting grumpy about things you talk to him a bit later so like, you know what's up i heard you was grumpy on your game it's like oh, they're, they're all taking the piss out of me because I haven't got this skin, so they're calling me a new blood. But I was like, yeah. But has, has oh, it affected the way you play the game? No. Has it changed no. your ability to play the game? No. no. Have you still been able to play the game the same as they have? Yes. Right. So you're the, you're the smart guy because you've still got 16 quid in your back pocket. They haven't. Yes. There you go. But, but this, this is what I was talking about with this, this my friend the other day. It's like... Kids are using games and microtransactions and the, the the skin culture now as a as a way to like it's social status though it it's all about if you haven't got this skin then you know I don't want to associate you with you and it's yeah it's well that's just stupid yeah it is stupid but this is this is the level we're dealing at it's like playground stuff and you know the, the, these game companies these developers are, are so connected to like the way kids think and and how they act and and like the way they think 
it's I don't know. I I can't see that it's it's gonna it's gonna get any better. It's just only gonna get worse. And the longer it goes on, I feel like game development is gonna completely change. And we're gonna see a lot more like free games come out because developers are, are shifting their um the way that they can earn their revenue. And it's like, well, actually, do I earn more for selling a $16 skin in the store, which I can update every week so everybody spends $16 a week on a new skin? or sixty dollars for a game yeah. i mean from a business sense it's a no-brainer absolute no-brainer you're going to keep pushing that microtransaction and the dlc and the skin kind of culture yeah. but at the same I mean, time it's been it's, like that for a long time yeah but at the same time it's it's a toxic culture which yeah. is completely destroying the industry in some ways because at the end yeah. of the day, you've got these shareholders and, and big owners of these companies who all they're looking at is the, the dollar signs and thinking, yep. right, how can we make money? All right, I don't care how broken this game is. We've got to get it out just so I can start pumping the store with DLC and skins and microtransactions so that we can then start earning money. That's why I love uh, indie, indie games. They don't do that for the most part. Well, they don't, but have you, have you heard the new... Over the last couple of days, have you heard the new way indie developers are going to get screwed? No, no, I haven't. So, obviously, um, a lot of indie developers use Unity as a game development engine, right? Yeah, yeah. So Unity this week came out and said they are now going to change the way they charge developers and their pricing plans, okay? So get this. Unity are now going to charge developers fee every time somebody installs a game on their machine wow that is how they are planning to make money from developers going forward right so i think like it works out to something like every time somebody first installs a game they're planning on charging them i think it's like 20 20 cents or something like that the hell well, but I've, that yeah, is I've never heard of that. that it, literally, it was news this week. It came out this week, and it was, it was a topic. That's absolutely mad. It was a topic that I had put across, uh, put to one side to discuss with you tonight, because I think in one way, this is like, it, it's, it's a double-edged sword, because if people want to support developers because they're really passionate about a developer's project, obviously they're going to buy the game, but then the developer is punished when the player plays the game. I mean, what sort of backwards business model is that? Honestly, it makes absolutely no sense. And if, if nothing else, I can see like a weird shift happening here, right? Where if you want to support a developer because you're passionate about them or passionate about their projects, go out and buy their game on like Steam or wherever it's on sale to support them by buying the game. But then you know what? Screw Unity. Once I've bought the game, I'm not going to install that version. I'm going to go find an off-site backup and play the game that way. Because yeah. then the developer's not getting screwed. I don't know. I don't think this is a... a, a I mean, let us know what your thoughts are, Deathfish, but I think this is a, a, a completely bizarre idea and business model from Unity. Considering they are, like, probably one of... Along with Unreal, they're probably, like, one of the biggest, like, publishing platforms... Yeah. For it's, 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 it's especially for mobile devices. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's not just uh, it's not just a case of we're dealing with full blown games here. The market for mobile games in Unity is absolutely huge as well. Definitely. Okay, so to give um, so to give a bit of context, like with this, let me just read a couple of articles or some like skim a few of these um, articles here. Uh, Unity, the tech company behind one of the most popular engines for creating video games, is scrambling to clarify how price increase for its services will work after its announcement Tuesday morning broadly infuriated the game developer community. So basically, the new runtime fee announced Tuesday morning is tied to a player's installations of a game, an action that previously didn't cost developers anything. With Unity's new plan, developers who use Unity's free tier of development services would owe Unity 20 cents per installation once their game hits a threshold of 200,000 downloads and earns $200,000 in revenue. 
Developers paying over $2,000 a year for Unity Pro Plan would have to hit higher thresholds and would be charged slightly lower fees. And the new system is being planned to be integrated at the start of 2024. And then another article here, which um, is headlined, Developers issue collective automation to Unity. No more iron source or Unity ads until runtime conditions are re reviewed. Basically, um, a group of some of the biggest names in the games have got together to pen a letter to Unity to clearly aim at readdressing the balance and taking back some power. With their games built on Unity platform already, they're hitting back in the only way that they can, removing Unity's iron source ad service and their games and shutting off the company's ad cash tap. So. Yeah, as, as you can see, like they're they're literally trying to sting people for installing games, as well as taking whatever other fees they already take. I think this is like an additional fee that yeah, they're looking to take. That's absolutely crazy. So you can't really blame these developers for like already taking a stance and like saying, you know what, you want to play like that? Fine, we're going to cut off your ad revenue, and um, I'm not sure what the iron source is, but. You know the the it's definitely been a big shakeup in the games industry, and developers are not happy. Of course not. Could this ultimately like be a nail in the coffin for Unity? I mean, I don't think it's going to completely kill them, but it's certainly going to ask yeah, questions. It's going to change the whole dynamic of everything that has to do with Unity because I mean, Unity has been used for a PC. Uh, especially, I've noticed that most mobile games use Unity. So. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing. I mean, like you, Unity is such a an easy platform to pick up and use. And with they having like the free tier, there's, there's they've got like their I can't remember what they call it, but like their university on their website. So they, you know, they've got loads of teaching resources and everything. And you know, I get, you know, are they looking that they need to maybe recoup some of the costs for the resources they provide? I get that. That's business. But to outrightly say, you know what, we're going to like, here's an extra charge you're now going to have to pay just to have people play your game. Yeah. Nah. It's just maybe their attempt to kind of like change their business model in a way to kind of like this service-based system that we've just been talking about, like like the microtransactions and the DLC. It's like, I know, okay. but just, just installing just installing a game and they're charging the developers because plenty of people install games and they never play them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's absolute bullshit and that is unacceptable, period. Yeah. So I go, I go, I go back to my previous comment. I mean, I don't, I don't, necessarily condone this behavior and this mentality at all but with this business model shift you know like i say the best way to support a developer would be to buy the game never play that game that you buy and instead go and find a pirate copy somewhere on an off-site backup where all that yeah. sort of license fee gubbins is taken out and then you can enjoy enjoy your game while positively um supporting developers I mean, it's it's such an underhand thing to do and to think of, but yeah, well, it's no more underhanded than what they're doing. I just find it's it's really it really it's really quite upsetting though, because you know, over like the, you know, with with me like turning away from portals so much and like broadening my horizons to the games, I've had so much joy in recent years playing games from indie developers because you know we've had this conversation before about how they can't afford to make the same mistakes that these AAA companies do, where it's like, oh, we're going to push out a half-baked game. We'll maybe patch it in a year. But while we're doing that, spend some more money on this, that, and the other. You know, independent developers don't have that luxury, and they know that if they don't put out a product which hits the mark is 95, well, I'd say even more than I said, but it's pretty solid, doesn't have bugs, works, does exactly what it says off the tin, then they know like any future games probably aren't going to happen because they're not going to get the the revenue and the publicity to be able to go on to future projects, which is a real shame for those sorts of people who have, you know, creative minds and creative insights and want to show off their creative abilities. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's really sad for me to see having so much joy out of indie games in the last couple of years, like I say, you know, that they're potentially gonna have to look for other routes considering you know they've probably spent you know years 
already in Unity Engine, playing their game, planning their game, you know, working on these projects, to then come to this news where actually, you know what, you're gonna have to pay a shit ton of money just for to to get it out to people. Yeah, it's crazy. This, this I mean, I, say, I broken, think uh, 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 like Unreal, the Unreal Engine is far superior. Yep. As far as it may be a slightly a little bit more of a learning curve, but I mean, it you can do so much more with it and yep. you have so much better graphics and so much better everything. And they don't do that. They, they do the last I remember, like if you exceed a certain amount of like, you know, like if you go, like if you're selling your game, it's free, but if you're selling your game, there's a fee. And then if you, you know, like if, you, if you're selling hundreds of thousands or millions of copies, then of course, the fees change, which is understandable. You know, if you, if you've got, but but it, yeah, I mean, if you've got a certain it, level of success, and then you know, as they, a, they let you create your game for free. Yeah, you know, you're not sitting there paying out of your pocket the whole time you're trying to develop a game. Like if you're just a one person or a three person or a ten person small company group or whatever. No, you can you can make a full triple A game if you desire and they don't charge you unless you know but yeah unity is they're, they're going the typical corporate way and yeah it's sad to hear because i mean unity is i think it's you know unity is a great engine to you know great platform for games it's, very, it's, it's 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 versatile you know you've got a lot of options with unity like i said you're not just developing for pc you know, the tools they can publish to mobile, they can publish to PlayStation, yeah. Xbox, VR. There is so much versatility with the engine. I just think this is going to seriously damage the reputation of Unity unless they can like get a hold of it and you know turn it around in some way. Because, like I say, there is a whole host of indie developers already on the bandwagon, which are uh, very disapproving of this news and um they are already kind of boycotting unity services where they can so um be very interesting to see over the next kind of like few weeks next month or so um how this one's going to play out but um yeah i genuinely don't think it's going to play out very well for unity at all i don't think so either just based on instincts and that yeah just based on what you said no that, that that that's just not something that's going to hold up. I mean that that's just going to force people to hundred percent switch over to other engines or or increase or increase the piracy market. That and and or create new engines uh, or or people that have their own uh, engines because some games don't use any of them. They made their own. Yep. They can go, okay, well, this is our time to go ahead and release our engine and spend six months in development and release it to developers and, you know, and not charge except for when they're selling their game, and then you get a percentage like they used to be. I yeah. mean, that's, that's, that's how it was, and that makes more sense. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I understand on their side that, it's yeah we've spent a lot of money a lot of time developing the software that allows people to make games as simply as possible but but you know to just want to charge for yeah installing a game no that's that's uh, that that's ludicrous. That's absolutely ridiculous on any level. It's it's kind of like I don't know, I pull something out of my ass and be like, okay, I walk into an ice cream parlor and because I walked in there, I gotta pay a dollar. Yeah, like 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 I'm going into a nightclub and have to pay uh you know an entrance fee. And then I decide, yeah, I don't really like any of these flavors. Never mind. I don't want any back out. Well, I paid a dollar for nothing. Yeah. You know, it's going to, yeah, it's, it's just, to me, it's batshit insane. And it's, I don't 
I, I hope I'm right I'm not saying I hope it backfires on them because man the other angle on it though that I've not really considered up until now listening to your comments is like it's potentially a way that people could underhandedly negatively affect a developer as well because it's like let's say yeah you uh, could just install the damn game over and over yeah I don't know the full ins and outs but I would like to say that there would be some sort of restriction on it where it can tie an install to a machine so that it can recognize it would recognize you know all right so this guy has already installed it once we're not going to charge it again but let's say for instance and, and i do this sometimes with some of my steam games it's like okay so i've got a pc i've got a laptop and you know evan's got a pc in his room well that's three installs on three different machines does that mean the developer's going to get charged 60 cents because I've installed it three times, even though there's only one yeah. person playing it. Yeah. So, yeah, like I say, it'll be very interesting to see um, the full ins and outs and, and how this one unfolds. Yeah, I, I, I feel like it's not going to be perceived favorably in the long term, and with, you know, from developers or, yeah, I just don't, I don't see it happening. I'd be surprised if it actually was sustained on the model uh, as you've explained it. I'd be surprised. Ultimately, it's a it's a time now where those that have already like lodged their disgust and their disapproval of this model need to just make sure they band together, they stand firm, and you know, surely logic will prevail, and you know their they're banding together in their actions and will be taken seriously because I guarantee it's just some some rich guy at the top of the chain who all he's bothered about is the, the, the dollar signs okay, in yeah. his eyes. He's not bothered about He doesn't understand how the industry works. All he's interested in is how much profit can we give to the shareholders. But yeah, you know, I, I just hope that they can, you know, stand, stand the ground, stand firm, and logic yeah. prevails in that. Fingers crossed. Um, anyway, yeah, 100%. I think we should probably look to uh, try and wrap this one up, Deathwish, because um, I've been going for a long time. I want to. I want to finish on something though that you sent me earlier on, uh, just as a little, uh, a little light-hearted note after such a serious conversation, right there. And um, this is a. I actually did a bit of research. So the Deathwish sent me this this short earlier on with this news story and i did a bit of research apparently the the news story is it's not recent I, I don't know if you know much about this the actual story behind it death wish i believe the story is back from um 2018 and it talks about this guy this chinese tourist who has been arrested with 300 zebra penises in his luggage okay <laughs> But I think what makes this, uh, this what made this story I didn't, even even better was the Facebook reel that you sent me and, and the guy who actually um, telling the yeah, yeah the, the, the comedian, comedian. actually like telling the story. So I'm just gonna let this one play out real quickly, guys, and hopefully you can have a bit of chuckle after that a serious subject. They they freaking nailed it. He, he's oh, yeah. have a listen to this, guys, and like I say, hopefully you can have a bit of a chuckle with this one. Anybody want to tell me what the hell going on in the airport in Kenya? A little Chinese boy got busted in the airport with not a gun, not a knife, not a bomb, not some anthrax, not a box cutter. He had 510 animal penis, 309 from a zebra, 14 from a lion, 27 from a giraffe, 46 baboon penis, 36 buffalo dicks, and 21 dingalings from a pink flamingo. Do you keep them all separated and labeled or do you just mix them all up like Chex Mix? How the hell you get your hands on a giraffe dick? Only person I know that probably can snatch a dick off a giraffe is Shaq. That sounds like some shit Shaq could do, y'all just be in the African safari minding y'all damn business all of a sudden he said I bet y'all go over there and snatch the dick off of that giraffe on with that bullshit Shaq the TSA was mad at the dog cause the dog sniffed the bags but didn't start barking he didn't say nothing I don't blame that goddamn dog I guess that damn dog was thinking hell if he snatched a dick off a wild animal what the hell you think he gonna do to me I start snitching he gonna start snatching I ain't got time for that shit I'm going to lunch in five minutes out of all them animals I feel sorry for the lion the most how the hell you supposed to be the king of the jungle and you out here roaring in soprano 
damn lion supposed to scare people with his roar. He just get, Rawr! that's a lion. Y'all done snatched the lion dick off. Now he running around the jungle sounding like this. <laughs> now the whole pride of lions is embarrassed as hell. Is that Mufasa sounding like that? All right, guys. Well, that's going to bring us to the end of our inaugural episode of the podcast. Deathwish, thank you, as always, for joining me on these uh, these ventures. Hope you've enjoyed the ride, and um, hopefully we can count on you in the next episode. I'm sure you'll be around. Oh, yeah. Uh, always glad to be a part of it. Always enjoy talking with you, and hopefully, you know, your, your captive audience will enjoy the, the ramblings of the famous rambling man and the new brit rambling man deputy rambling man will call me <laughs> rambling man 2.0 i mean i said i said i did say to you like in in before we like sat down and did this like i was quite worried about like how it was going to go and you know but I, I i feel like you know just going off on the tangent sitting here and and you know, just just being ourselves. I've enjoyed it, so hopefully everybody who's listening along has enjoyed it. As I said at the start, though, guys, if you've got any like ideas or topics that you would like us to discuss in future episodes, do let us know down below. As well, if you would like to see any special guests on the show or any suggestions for special guests, please do let us know, as it is something that uh, I personally really want to. Uh, get on the show and sure it'll be a, a good crack to get uh, somebody else involved along with the two old gits sat in the corner rambling about how the world is going to shit <laughs> anyway though, guys thank you very much for tuning in like i said death wish thank you very much for hanging any final words any final words oh yeah no just uh thanks for having me and enjoyed the discussion ride and I think we'll uh, keep getting better as we go. Oh, with a, without a doubt. Without a doubt. You know, I just need to tighten the reins a little bit more on the old uh, the old Master Rambler. Yeah, I mean, we went completely <laughs> off the cuff, and uh, I think I think it was pretty good for our first, first outing. Yeah, so I think people will appreciate what you're trying to do, and hopefully... And, enjoy the discussions and that sort of thing yeah it was something that um you know people had been asking for so hopefully those people who had mentioned it and was really keen on the idea have enjoyed the show and like i said it's, it's something i've been planning on and off since 2018 so to actually be able to like get a first episode out here is um is well it's about damn it's time about damn time as well yeah. <laughs> i've got, I got another project though that i've been sat on for many years that i wrote an entire script for and never actually did anything with so i don't know maybe in a future episode of the podcast it'll be nice just to have a bit of a story time and uh actually rather than do a video we'll uh we'll have a bit of a story time with knock kind of thing yeah. who knows maybe we'll even bring in smarts and crafts at some point but that's enough about that oh boy thank you very much everybody for tuning in thanks Deathwish, for being on board um and until the next one thank you very much guys I don't really know how to sign this off. Peace out. Peace.